I've done it a couple of times. But can, can we define a cashier for everyone? A cashier is when you do the fare, but you don't declare it to the cab company, and so they don't get their share. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's it. It doesn't run through the computer system. Yeah. It doesn't run on the meter. Yeah. And uh, so the other cab driver said, oh, you just do a few cashies to make it up. Yeah. But, I'm, you know, I've done it a couple of times and I've never felt comfortable doing that. And, yep. And, um, and so after the second Con Act, you know, after the first Con Act, I thought, oh, well, yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can organise, you know... Uh, was the first one $20, Manny? The first one was 20 Okay, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and uh, I thought I'd... I'd, I'd organise some cashies. The next cashies that came up that someone offered me cashies, I'd do it. And in fact, I actually offered some people some cashies and that turned into a, a disaster. <laughs> 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 and, and then the very next night, I had the $45 one. Yeah, okay. So, notice the emotion not dealt with, bigger law of attraction event. Yeah. yeah, so that night, I just... Um, like, it took me a few days because she promised to ring me and she gave me her address and, all, and phone number and all that sort of stuff. So it took me a few days to figure out that she wasn't going to pay, that she'd given me a bogus address and a bogus phone number. And um, so, but eventually I just, it just, it just was sort of a, this feeling of relief came over me where I just went, oh, oh okay, well, um, the money's not important. Mm -hmm. You know, it does, I don't feel like I need to get recompense on it, and and that I felt like I'd worked through a whole lot of stuff on it. Yeah. You know, and I thought felt like, well, this has actually been a good thing for me. Yeah. You know? But you also worked through this issue with your your bosses, did you too? Like you had to, you realised that there was this unfair feeling that came up in you as well that you then also had to deal with. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'd, I'd emailed the general manager about it. Yeah. Um, so I tried to address it on the, uh, in, you know, in address the injustice, but it couldn't be addressed by pleading, <laughs> if you like. And uh, so now it just feels like, oh, well, any time anybody that, does that to me, that's just my law of attraction and I'll see what I feel. Yeah, that's you know, it. So I, I don't feel like any, I have any need now to, to try and do cashies to make it up, you know. <laughs> and, and, and you know what, when I realised that I'd had that change in myself, it was just such a feeling of relief. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was, oh God, that's, that's so good. And it, there's also an issue of trusting God here, which you you actually came to trust God more, that actually everything was happening for you to deal with emotions that would bring you closer to God as well. well, well yeah, well, I came to see those two events as very beneficial things for me. Yeah, yeah. So can you see how Graham owned his law of attraction? Most of the time we don't own our law of attraction. What we do is we blame everyone around us for our law of attraction. <laughs> Generally, that's what we do. So we get angry with them, upset with them, blame them, want to punish them, want to make them pay, and do all the other things that we do because of our own law of attraction. And that's not a very fair thing for us to do, but, but it's actually what we do most of the time. So my suggestion is look at the law of attraction and live in harmony with it. You notice some of the examples I've given. If you... Like, let's say um, you have this huge desire to punish men because of all the hurt they've given you in their life. What that's doing is it's skipping over your own law of attraction in that actually there is some emotion in you, causal emotion in you that's caused these men to do this that needs to be addressed. And while you harbour all this anger and resentment towards the men, you're not actually dealing with the underlying causal emotion that created the law of attraction. So. Remember, I've said to you often, very often, notice your law of attraction. If it's not changing, it means you're not addressing causal emotion. Also, with your law of attraction, notice other people's law of attraction and encourage them to see, if you love them, you will encourage them to see that it's actually an emotion in them that created the event. Now, I've had this happen so many times where it's been really, like most people, uh, would have really cringed at some of the discussions I've had with some people. An example was uh, I was talking to a couple who lost their child. Right? Their child died from an accident. And I told them that it was their law of attraction. 
That's a pretty big thing to say to, to somebody who's grieving, isn't it? But it is also the truth. There was a law of attraction of emotions in the parents and we discussed those emotions and everything and they were open to that discussion and they could eventually see that it was their law of attraction that created the passing of their child. And that there was some causal emotion in them that they needed to work through. Now, the majority of people in that situation would have got very angry with me and I've had lots of people get angry with me about that situation in the past. And that's my law of attraction. A fear of telling the truth no matter what the cost. You see, in the first century, the cost was my life. So you think I'm a bit afraid of telling the truth sometimes. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> right? And I've had to deal with that emotion. Mary gets afraid of me telling the truth sometimes because she had to, has to had, have to deal with the emotion of losing her soulmate for 30 or 40 years um, as a result of me being in truth. So there's been emotions we've had to work through. Can you see that if we, help, if we really love another person, we will always tell them the truth about their law of attraction? Even if in the end they don't love us anymore because we said that thing. Right. So that requires courage, doesn't it, to actually do that. And, and a lot of love for people to be able to do that. So when people, things happen to people, Encourage them to see that it's the law of attraction that's created that. Anna? I have a question about Graham and the taxi. Yep. Like, at first I felt it was unfair and then I sort of felt that the, the taxi company is sort of just, in a way it's just allowing individuals to have their own law of attraction with, with, with whether they get paid or whether they don't. Like, so, so what, do you, what do you feel? Well, um, I would, if it was me, and I'm not saying, by the way, that Graham needs to do this. If it was me, I would address the issue with the company, and if they said to me that they were going to continue the same policy with me, I don't, it doesn't worry me what how the policy they decide to continue with these other drivers, but if they decide to continue the same policy with me, because I'm an honest man, um, when I tell them that somebody's reneged on a fare and I didn't get paid, that's very unfair and we should share in the loss because we share in the gains and I would say to them that if they're not going to do that then I wouldn't be able to work for them anymore. So I'd be prepared to lose my job over the issue um, and then deal with all that emotion as well that it brings up in me of uh, lack of abundance and whatever else. And um, is Luli here today? No. Um, Louise Faber is, a, is a, one of the ladies, girls who come along to our group. She's done this in her job recently. She's a doctor of neuroscience and what she does, uh, what she had been doing was being very involved in uh, experimenting on animals for, for, for neuroscientific research. And that's the only thing that the organisation she works for does. It's a government organisation, I think. So. So what she realised that was she was she was out out of harmony with love, she felt. So she trotted off to the director of the organisation and said she can't do this job anymore. She's going to have to leave because she couldn't work on animals anymore. And uh, they thought about it, I think, for a day or so, and they got him back, got, got her back in, and said, "Oh, we're going to create a new position for you. We're going to create a position where you don't have to work on animals at all." But the new position was that she had to get funding and had to prepare papers for, of research justifying the use of animals. <laughs> uh, so she goes away, feels all about that again, right? and then she trots back up to the director again and says, you know this new position that you've created for me, I can't do that position either. And the reason why I can't do that position is because of this reason. Because I'd be actually supporting others doing this damage that I don't want to do to animals. And uh, she fully expecting again to lose her job and have to go somewhere else. Anyway, she goes off and uh, they invite her back up again and they've created a new position for her. <laughs> this new position is, uh, is investigation into neuroscientific research and spirituality. Oh. Which, is, which is right up her alley. <laughs> yeah. So isn't that wonderful? 
her yeah. confronting the emotion, she, she did a lot of crying. And I, I must say she did a lot of emotional processing <laughs> in between each phase, right, of working through issues of a lack of abundance, working through why she was compromising to get m this money and all these kind of other things, working through all of that. And then in the end she got to this point and, then she, was, and she actually got offered the job that is like her dream job in a way. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and she can see now also that in action, following through with all the truth, what actually the end result has become is that it exposed to her what her passion was. Does that make sense? Which is a combination of neuroscientific research with emotional and spiritual development and linking the two together. You think how powerful that's going to be for the future. You have a good, having some, some really strong ev like evidence presented to the scientific world that there is a relationship between those things. And that, so that's her passion. So that's a very good example, I thought. At the back. Uh, this is to do with uh, Graham's story, something that's been going on inside me for years. Um, if I was to add up all the money that I've handed out and never had back, yeah. in the past I have n not been anxious or worried because I know what goes out comes back. Can I just address that emotion? You don't know that, because otherwise you wouldn't oh. be talking about it right now. But let's keep going. <laughs> That's confused me now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, there is a feeling in you, though, that that doesn't happen. You, it's a, you have a hope of it happening, I agree. But the feeling that you have in your own life is that it hasn't happened. And so there's this feeling inside of you that doesn't agree with your intellectual thought that it does happen. Yes, because it's not happening. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, which has le led to me having to change my attitude yeah. about helping people financially. Exactly. Because that's your law of attraction. Your law of attraction is you're giving, giving, giving at your own expense all the time because you were, fo you were actually, what you were doing also, was focusing on the effect in other people's life and trying to cure their effects and not the cause. You weren't addressing the causes. So you were breaking quite a few of the laws of God. Does that make sense? The law of abundance only works when we're actually not breaking these other laws, generally. All right? so, so that's the other thing to bear in mind. So yes, you're dead right. Um, you have this emotion in you where you don't actually believe what you thought you believed and there is an emotion in you of wanting to help others by dealing with the effects rather than the actual causes. And that come, there's, a, there's an emotion that is an addiction in you that came from it and that's the thing you've got to look at. That's the thing you've got to look at. Do you know what it might be? Fear of rejection. Okay, so if you're doing things for people all the time, you're never going to get rejected. They're always going to want you, aren't they? Particularly if a little payment comes along with it. <laughs> I'm paying you to, look at, to like me. I'm paying you to like me. I'm paying you to like me. <laughs> In the end, everyone's going to like you, right? Till the money runs out. Till the money runs out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it's, is it okay to... Because I kind of feel hard and callous about not helping because there's another situation. Well coming. now you're starting to get into uh, some underlying emotions that are really there which is this emotion that uh, if you don't help a person in need that there's something bad about yourself. So it's a bit, there is some very strong beliefs about love that you have that are actually not true mm. about... Uh, so, so Loving like for with instance, a condition. Sorry? L loving with a condition. Um, that's how you feel like that you're loving with a condition? Or what are you saying? Um, that there is a condition behind why I get, why I hand it out. Yes, there's a condition inside of yourself. There's something you get back, mm -hmm. and that's the addiction. That's why you do it. And the key is to go underneath that because you were starting to touch on the emotion in your previous comment. Mm -hmm. right, so if you if you allow yourself just to feel that emotion of what happens if you don't give out. The emotion that you're starting to feel was, I must be a bad person mm. because I don't want to give anymore. There's that emotion in there. Allow yourself to start really settling into that emotion. So feel all those <coughs> and then hopefully the money will come back. 
the money would definitely come back. But, but when you deal also with the laws of abundance, like there's a, there's a whole series of laws about abundance that need to be worked through for most of us uh, to actually have money flow, or, or to have wealth, and I, and I use wealth very loosely uh, in the sense of it's not just financial, like it's all sorts of areas of our life flow into our life. Yep. Thank you. All right, well, it's three, three o'clock, so let's uh, have a break now. For, can we do it for 45 minutes? Every time I say 45 minutes, it's always an hour. So it's 45 <laughs> minutes, <laughs> and I'll see you in an hour. I was <laughs> <laughs> doing really weird things today for some reason, so I'm going like blurred and then all of a sudden clear again. and then really, really f yeah. It's funny when I'm processing sometimes, um, I have, because I'm, I'm short-sighted, which means I can't see long distances very well. And uh, there's obviously some pretty good reasons for that. <laughs> uh, one, of, one of which is I don't want to see the future very much at the moment. But, um, yeah. No, it's just the kids up there. Oh, yeah. They might be on the roof, mind you. <laughs> so, so whoever's children they are, they might... Unless Peter is okay with them on the roof. Well, <laughs> they guide me, AJ. Is it loving to leave them there or is it loving to go and suggest that they jump down? Well, it, it's actually being created by their parents' law of attraction. So, so um, there's obviously something going on to trigger the parents. And one of those things might be embarrassment or another thing might be, you know, the potential of an accident and the fear that's in the parent about that. Or So, so the key is if you're one of those parents <laughs> or one of those children <laughs> that are working on the roof, feel your emotions about should, what's going on. I should mention that the electricity for the whole building runs, it's only that high over the roof and it runs in on that corner. So the electricity for the whole roof only runs in that high above the roof on this and corner. They're running on the roof. And they're running on the roof. So if you have some children up there, um, that should have triggered your fear, fear a little more. <laughs> <laughs> better to know that. Oh yeah, it's better to know that. <laughs> and, and bear in mind that these meetings are not like something you're going to be at an insurance claim against later. <laughs> Because they're uh, all by donation and... Uh, and it's not you know. like a free-for-all either. <laughs> yeah, true. But that's something you need to feel, Pete. Because there's, there's some feelings coming up for you there. So let yourself feel about that too. Yeah. You're right. And let yourself feel about it. <laughs> Peter has this feeling of being unloved at times that he needs to connect to. Once you connect to that, a lot of these things will, will be dealt with differently. All right. And... Um, and uh, yeah, that being said, uh, Peter had to put that sign on the uh, on the tea and coffee box that, that <laughs> the donations didn't cover the <laughs> tea and coffee. Um, so if you can just bear that in mind as well, that's another one of your law of attraction events to deal with this <laughs> to deal with this unloving emotion, this unloved emotion that you feel. Yeah. Um, the key with all of this love stuff is to to see everything in terms of what's going on within yourself. Always to see it like that. Well, as soon as you externalise everything, you have, for a start, it makes sense, you have no control anymore as soon as you start blaming everyone else, for a start, don't you? And the truth is that everything that's coming into your life is your creation. So we need to start seeing it as that. Now, I'm not talking about our children, because our, what comes into our children's life is our creation as an adult. Right? So we still need to see it as an adult, that it's our creation. And obviously our children are learning... Uh, creators in training, right? And by what we do with our own law of attraction and our own, all of these laws that we're putting into place is how we're teaching our child to create in their life as well. So allow yourself to work through those issues. There's still some children up there, so... <laughs> all right, let's move on to the next laws. There's um, if you can grab a mic before you say it, that'll be good. Yep. Yeah. <coughs> up the right way. That's right. The other way. You'll be right. Um, the lollipop goes on the top. Yeah. Um, just before we go on to the next segment, I yep. uh, just want to say I have a healing centre, as you know, at Karoi. Yep. 
and uh, it's been going for about seven and a half years now. Yep. And uh, just lately there's been disharmony in the centre. Yes. And you mean between the different people providing the healing? Yes. Yep. Yes. And uh, I want to know, you know, what my role should be now. Well, with anything that happens in our lives, the first thing we need to always do, which is what I've just said, is to look at what emotion inside of me is being triggered by this event for a start and then the next thing to do if we're in a in a place where we're actually facilitating something is to get everyone together and ask them to do the same about their stuff what emotions inside of you what is emotions inside of you what emotions inside of you ask yourself these things all of you at some point need to see the emotion inside of you creating this this event focus them on their law of attraction and focus them on the fact that it's their life that's creating this stuff going on. I feel it's actually a good thing because a lot of the seeming harmony that you had before was actually just fake harmony based at where everyone was overlooking everyone else's injuries and emotions. Now there's, be, there's less inclination to do that. Probably what's happening, I would suggest, is that in their sleep state, some of them are starting to understand the importance of emotions and now in the awake state feel this sort of upset feelings and, and so forth which they start projecting. The key is to help them through the process, whenever you're helping anyone else, help them through the process of doing everything in a loving way. So you can deal with your emotions of anger, for example, in a loving way. You can deal with your emotions of sadness in a loving way. If you feel hurt, you can do that, deal with that in a loving way by firstly being humble and feeling all of your emo own emotions. So focus them on the laws and away from the situation itself and on the laws and the emotions that it's creating inside of themselves and, and ask them to work their way through those emotions. And then I'd be tempted to say to them, anyone that doesn't do that, well, I'll be asking you to leave and we'll keep the ones here who do do that. Yeah. And you will actually find, a lot of times when we're having a practice or a company or a business or any of those kind of things or a healing centre that we're providing healing for others for free or whatever it is that we've got, we are so emotionally invested in keeping it as it is or making it grow that we don't actually recognise the emotions in each individual that are preventing its growth. Yeah. And the beauty of these changes that occur is that the people who can't handle this, the, 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 the potential for growth will leave mm -hmm. and the people who are in this space where they can grow will stay with you yeah. and they will grow with you. So understand that what, a lot of things need to be destroyed before they can be created in the manner in which you know is in harmony with God's laws because a lot of our creations are in fact creations that are based on disharmony with love rather than har harmony with love. Yeah. yeah. So allow yourself to see it as, oh, well, this doesn't mean it's all going to finish in the end. Mm. What it means is it's going to go through this change and there's going to be some teething problems and there's going to be some emotions come up. But if we can help as many of them get through this process emotionally, mm. in the end you'll have a team of people who are able to heal people with far more power <coughs> and that will actually attract far more people yeah. in, in the end. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And by the way, if you have a company or a business or any of those kind of things, the same things apply. Mm. Don't be afraid of change. Don't be afraid of it going small again and because you're working through emotions of truth. Because what's happened often is we have, we have created these mansions, but they're based on you know, foundations of sand. And in the end, a storm's going to come along and just blow it all over. And, and unless we start considering to build things on a foundation of rock, we're not really it's not really going to come good in the end. So what you're going through is this process of changing it so that it's got a good foundation of solid, solid, firm foundation, connecting with all of God's laws and particularly the laws of divine love. And that is going to mean that it will grow in the end. And this example that I gave you earlier, remember, of, of, Lulu, of Lily with her neuroscience job, was, you know, she went through this process of, oh, I can't do that, so I've got to go and do that, can't do that, so I've got to go and, you know, and, and eventually, in the end, what did she end up with? Look, looking like, even, something that's more like what she was imagining herself to be doing anyway, and getting paid for it. Yeah. And this is what will often happen with regard to our own lives when we focus on the truth. So many of us believe that if we focus on the truth and focus on the principles that everything will be destroyed around us and we'll never get it back. 
But the truth is actually that yes, everything that you've constructed that is based on falsehood and based on error will all be destroyed. Yes, I agree totally. And what you'll get in the end is everything constructed on truth which will be far more powerful and far more everlasting than anything you could have considered any other way. Mm. Yeah. Okay, All right, let's uh, move on to the next law that I want to discuss. <laughs> forgiveness, yeah. <laughs> law of forgiveness. Uh, give uh, ness. <laughs> Squished. All right. Um, now, the law of forgiveness is a, is a law that I want to spend a lot more time on later. It's a very essential part of your spiritual journey, and so it, it, there is a lot of emotions involved in forgiveness. But the reason why I'd like to raise it right now is because when we put into practice this law, we're actually being loving towards others. Now, you notice in the example I've give, given that we freely forgive others so the definition of forgiveness is freely forgiving others just as God has already forgiven us. <coughs> Absolutely everything you've already done that it, well, was disharmonious with love, God has already forgiven you for. Right. And God in fact forgives you even if you did it on purpose. And God does that every single time you do it. So you think yesterday, day before, day before, once we learn some of these things, we realise, gee, most of the days we've got something that we need to be forgiven for here, you know. And God has already forgiven you for it. Do we understand that? Like, that God has already forgiven us. Jerry, thanks. You're talking about, uh, you're talking about penalty yesterday. Um, even though there's God's forgiveness, Penalty, does penalty still uh, be applied? You know what I mean? Of course, because remember it's not God that applies penalties. The, the laws have an automatic, remember we talked about consequence. Yeah. So if, if we, the laws automatic have a consequence on our soul. But God already has forgiven us for what we've done. Hmm. But that doesn't mean that God's taken away the consequence from our soul. There's two different feelings here. And it's important to understand the difference between forgiveness and grace or mercy. All right, very important. But we're talking about the quality of forgiveness here, and in a minute I'll talk about the quality of mercy as it comes from you, not from God. Hmm. All right, so in, a, in, a, in other words, as you display it to other people. Yeah. yeah. So those penal uh, regarding penalties, again, once we work, uh, do our own homework, in other words, are those penalties eventually... Um, Released or well, no, I've already discussed how penalties are released. There's yeah. two ways, remember, that I've mentioned, and one was the law of repentance, and the other way is the law of compensation. So we'll talk more about those laws at another time in detail, but there's only two ways that the consequences of our actions can ever be released from our soul. Both of them are very emotional. One takes a very long time. <laughs> right? The law of compensation is very emotional and takes a very long time. The law of repentance, which is a divine love law, it's a very short period of time, but very emotional as well. And it's a matter of using one of those laws in a feeling way in order to work your way through the issues. What we're talking about here, though, is the law of forgiveness with regard to others. My personal forgiving of other people. And one of the main reasons why I would do it is because I know that every single day I do lots of things that God needs to be forgive me for. Can you see that? Like, like, how many of us feel that we've done the perfect job with our children after listening to the parenting talk? <laughs> Even before. <laughs> Even before many of us were having trouble, but after the parenting talk, it's all, oh, it's like, yeah. Can you see that we've, we straight away have many things that we feel God would need to forgive us for as a parent, for example? So, so then when we see a parent doing a damaging thing to a child, can we see that we can automatically forgive that parent? Like, just by remi reminding ourselves that we ourselves have also done many things to harm our own children? Now, the, f the act of forgiveness is a very, very powerful act. But what it involves is you actually feeling 
in a humble state all of your emotions about their action. So if you're a parent and you notice another parent damaging their child, the initial emotion in you might be one of outrage, right? Sadness, like lots of different emotions might come up with you. To be truly forgiving, you need to feel and release every single one of those emotions. So that all that comes up in you is a feeling of compassion for the child and a compassion for the parent and a desire to assist the situation using what you now know to be God's laws on the subject. So I don't mean I just stand back and watch it all happen at all. But I mean, firstly, what I need to do before I can help the situation at all, I need to go through this process of forgiving both the person who's doing the act of harm. I need to get to the process where I can forgive them before I can actually help them. Can you see why? Because if you go in there, right, boots and all, in a fighting spirit, because you're all upset about what they're doing, can you see straight away you've just judged them? You've just condemned them. And what are they going to feel from you? Judgment, condemnation. Do you think that makes their rage stronger or less? Stronger, of course. Can you see if I actually forgive the person by actually feeling all of my own emotions and releasing them, and when I say releasing them, it may take you a week, it may take you five weeks, it may take you ten weeks to get through this process of releasing them. If I can now go to them and talk to them about that subject, I'm no longer in this space of judging them for their actions. I can actually make very clear suggestions to them. I can actually help them and their child in that state because I'm in a loving space towards both of them. But if I'm coming from this really angry, upset place, projecting that at them, obviously I am now in a state of disharmony with love, aren't I? So I'm now doing exactly the same to that parent as what the parent's doing to the child. And from God's perspective, I am in just as much error as that parent is now. Can you see that? So to truly forgive that parent, I need to work through the issue of forgiveness, which means allowing, being humble enough to these emotions that come up in me as a result of their actions and actually work through those feelings myself. Now when I do that, I'm actually now, I can actually now forgive the other person. And this is what, we're getting back to it, that discussion we had earlier with that man about the psych, psychiatry ward. That's really what he was doing. By forgiving himself, he was actually releasing the emotion within himself that would cause him to be similar to that person or that was being triggered by that person. And in the process, that releases, in the case of this example, the spirit who was with the person causing them to do certain actions. Forgiveness is a very, very powerful mechanism by which you can help others. All right. Peter. <laughs> On that point, there's um, a lot of, when, when you read the pageant messages, there's a lot of messages where people went into the hells <laughs> and they stayed there for a long, long time until they suddenly realised that if they forgave the people who hurt them, then all of a sudden they instantly improved their condition and they went into a completely different place almost immediately after being stuck there for hundreds or even longer years. That's correct. And that that lesson was like probably their most important lesson perhaps. That's right. I've talked to groups of uh, slave spirits, as I mentioned yesterday, who have a just terrible anger and rage and feelings of hurt that they want to harm the people who harm them. In other words, they weren't forgiving the other person. And the reason why they couldn't was because they had all these hurt emotions inside of themselves that they weren't willing to personally experience. And then when they did that, within a, within a few moments, they went to another location in the spirit world. Right? They just progressed straight away from that one location to a new location. So forgiveness is a very, very powerful, powerful emotion. Now, when it comes to breaking the law, we often have very strong feelings of justice. You know, the eye for an eye to teaching that makes the whole world blind. You know, that, that teaching. That's a very biblical thing that most of us are growing up with because we have these deep feelings in ourselves of, I want to have revenge for all the hurt that other people have done to me. 
And you know, we can even take that to a fuller extent, and that is, we go down this track of saying, I want to hurt every person because I had this one person hurt me. <laughs> like, you think about it in terms of the intergender problems that we have on Earth today. How many men or how many women feel hatred towards the opposite gender because of just their mother or father harming them? So they're not happy with just harming their mother in return. <laughs> they want to now harm every woman in the whole Earth. Right? Or they're not happy harming every, their father in return. They want to harm every person. And this is the problem with this kind of lack of forgiveness is that we often become so embroiled in the rageful emotions because we don't forgive. What happens is that we finish up projecting it not just at the person who created the error within us, the emotion within us, but we project it at every single person that we can who fits the bill. Now, how many of you have you, as an older woman, let's say, had a younger man get angry with you? Like, had a younger man sometime in your life just seemingly un like, get angry with you? Today. Like, today, okay. Now, <laughs> yeah. right? now, now, what's happening there? What, like, this man, uh, besides your law of attraction, I'm, we talked about that before, but what we're talking about here is forgiveness. This man obviously has issues with women and he's willing to project them at you. Right? Because why? You didn't do it. You didn't do the thing that he's upset about years ago that he's held on to all of his life. But because this emotion is still within him and he can't forgive, he can't let it go, he can't feel the emotion and release it from him, he now wants to project it at any person who comes into his sphere of operation into his life so that he can actually feel this justified feeling that he actually has really towards one or two people. Now, you see this happening all the time with inter-race rivalry, don't you? One person from my past happened to be a Chinese person who ripped me off. So now, every time I see a Chinese person, I just believe they're going to rip me off. Right? It's true. This is what we do. <laughs> Peter, Peter's had a Chinese person rip him off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this is what we do, isn't it, a lot of times? And you, we, we see it even taken to the full extent. And the full extent is what? Where we're willing to actually kill a person, right? Or feel so much hatred towards them that we'd like them to be killed just because of what we feel they did to us. There's a really good movie I suggest you watch. Uh, it's called Twelve and Holding. Twelve and Holding. It's about a group of four, four twelve-year-old children who have huge amounts of projected emotions coming at them from their parents and what they do with those emotions. And it's a really powerful movie, isn't it, babe? Like, yeah, powerful movie. Another really good uh, movie to watch uh, about this subject in particular, forgiveness, or, but also the effects of emotions, is The Merchant of Venice. That's actually on the sheet. Yeah, I know. The recent one, we've got Jeremy Irons in it and Al Pacino. It's very well done. Um, really good story as a Shakespeare story obviously uh, really good story and the way it's depicted is really well uh, but it illustrates a lot of these issues of repentance and forgiveness and why a person can't give it up what's going on within themselves that they can't give up certain emotions allow yourself to connect to those emotionally good movies to watch to connect some of those things feelings The problem with um, us most of the time is that we're so willing to project anger at other people, hey? And yet, most of us, in fact, when we think about it, all of us, before we even come to one of these sessions, we knew that anger from somebody else hurts us. Like, how many of you thought that if someone was angry with you, it was okay before you came to one of these sessions? And yet, how many of us in the course of a day still get angry with someone else? Right? Can you see how often we're not just about a lot of these things in, in our own lives? Can you see that? 
Can we have a mic just behind there? Uh, just there. Could you please just explain um, projection? As if I'm not feeling my own causal emotions, I am projecting those emotions to the universe. So in other words, every single person around me is going to be feeling those emotions. So if you're angry, shouldn't you be allowing yourself to feel that anger? That's a better place than actually not feeling the anger but being in a rage, yes. But, it, but it's still not owning the causal emotion. Remember I said it's the causal emotion we need to own. If you're allowing yourself to feel the anger but not actually being angry at anyone, is that projecting? Um, if you're allowing yourself to feel the anger and you're punching a bag and you're really connecting with the anger, now you're not projecting the anger. You're actually owning the anger and letting it pass through you. What if you're just sitting there and allowing yourself to see and feel it? Yeah. But you're not projecting at anyone? There's no one in mind. No. You're just angry and you're feeling it. And That's doing it less, but, but, but it's still projecting because you're not actually in the rage itself. Do you know what I mean? You're not actually feeling and experiencing it completely. It's a bit like people often say to me, uh, when you're sad, will you cry? I don't cry when I get sad. I often hear this. Right? I don't cry when I get sad. I just sit down and I feel sad. And I don't cry. Well, my, my, I'm saying to you, if you're not crying when you're sad, then you're not feeling sad. You are actually sitting in your sadness. But you're not feeling and experiencing the sadness. You know, that's why God gave us tear ducts to actually experience <laughs> the sadness. Well, that's one operation of them anyway. <laughs> the, the, the truth is that if you're not experiencing the emotion completely, there is always some projection coming from you. All right? So the key with all of our emotion is to experience it completely through total ownership. All right? And so my suggestion is if we're angry and we're just sitting there seething, we're not actually fully experiencing the underlying causal emotion yet, so we're actually in a state where we want to seethe. And so we are still projecting at other people. So quite a lot on the forum lately, uh, Mary's pointed out to me that different ones are <coughs> justifying their projections. If you justify your projections, you're out of harmony with love. Because a loving person doesn't want to harm anyone around them and you are automatically harming a person around you if you decide that you can be angry with everyone around you. You are, yes, allowed to experience that and yes, you are allowed to be angry with everyone around you because of the law of free will. So I'm not saying you're not allowed to do it. What I'm saying is that you damage your own soul by doing it. And also, of course, potentially the soul of many others. And we've got to look at the underlying reasons why we turn to anger. There's always an underlying reason which is capped by a fear and we need to access it. We need to go deeper into our emotions. So allow ourselves to do that. Now, the beauty of forgiveness, we'll talk more later about forgiving ourselves, which is actually a different process. We're talking here about the forgiveness of others because we're talking about our relationship with others. We're talking about forgiveness of others. So the forgiveness of others is so important in our life. And it's so important for them as well. Because you'll notice that any person you truly forgive in your heart will change in their interaction with you without you having to say a word. Now some of you have already experienced that right, in your lives. Where you've actually gone through the process of owning all of your emotions to such an extent that you have no more emotion about that person that's negative and you feel just a feeling of love towards them and now all of a sudden they interact with you quite differently. Or leave you alone. Or they leave you alone, yeah. But they will interact you, with you differently in each case. Uh, Ken down the front there. Does that, does that apply for a spirit? Yes. Like, for me, uh, the person who did this to me w has since passed. Has passed, yes. Can you, I forgive them even though I'm still alive and they're yes. in the spirit world? Yes, oh. yes. And, and in fact, um, it's even more powerful for them um, than it is for a, perhaps for a person on earth because a person on earth often is very distracted emotionally from your process of forgiveness, but a person in the spirit world is often very attracted to you when you go through the process of forgiveness. So it actually has an even more powerful effect on a spirit than it does on a person on earth. So remember that with all of these interactions of, with people that you have of people who have passed. 
with your fathers or mothers or whatever who have passed who have harmed you. The process of forgiveness just assists them so much. Thanks, up the back, thanks. How will I know if I have forgiven or become passive? Because I'm quite a passive person. Yep. But that possibly could be because I deny my anger? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Good question. Because a lot of times in the world today we see people saying, oh, I've forgiven that person, but actually all they've done is just suppressed and buried the real emotions. The way you know is the way you know about everything that's changing in your life. Firstly, the law of attraction changes. So your law of attraction with the person who you have the aggro with or the anger with will change. They will feel something different from you when you truly forgive that they haven't felt before. And often they'll feel motivated to talk to you about that. But even if they don't, you will also notice the law of attraction change with them. You might meet them again and you'll notice your own feelings. Oh, I don't feel angry with them anymore. Oh, okay, you know, I feel like I can love them now, you know. And you'll feel that with your parents or, or any other person that you feel that angry feelings towards. But if you have a feeling of wanting to block them out of your life, right? They keep popping into your life, but you want to block them out, you know? You keep seeing them down the street, but you want to try and oh, walk around the other road. You know, uh, you see them down, the, you know, when you're into the movie theater, or, you know, or, you know, go and sit over in the corner, you know, whatever it is that happens. Well, that's you denying some really deep emotions of resentment. So allow yourself to work through them. Let yourself bring them up and work your way through them. Because when you forgive, you won't feel like you need to avoid them. right? But your law of attraction will be that they may avoid you still if they have been harmful to you in the past. So I'm not suggesting that you automatically, and we'll talk about the laws of self-love next time, but I'm not suggesting that you go and autom put yourself in harm's way knowing that they're going to bop you in the nose every time. Right? If you know that, then the question I have is deal with the underlying emotion of why you would put yourself in a position where you're getting harmed all the time. That's a bit like the woman who's being abused by a man and doesn't want to leave her. It leave him, isn't it? And she gets getting abused, getting abused, getting abused, getting abused. So that you know, she's not forgiving him or herself in that situation, by the way. Uh, all that's happening is her anger, her anger, and other emotions are just building and building and building, and sooner or later they're going to get to a powder keg, and this is why there's a lot of domestic violence. Because in the end it gets to a powder keg and one or the other persons finish up doing some harm to each other. Uh, because the emotions are not getting dealt with. So I'm suggesting with forgiveness, when you go through the process of forgiveness, it does not automatically mean that you will remain with the person who's harming you. So we'll talk about that in a minute, because that's the process of mercy. Someone? Is there any free to your oh, you, you can say. <laughs> I just wanted to reiterate that if you're truly humble, then all, this whole process happens very naturally. Mm. If you're yep. just feeling all of your emotions, then you'll naturally forgive. Yeah. So you imagine if you're really humble, which remember we, desire, we said was a burning desire for you to experience all of your own emotions. If you're truly humble, the instant somebody does something to quotation marks harm you will be the instant you also forgive them. You can see that, can't you? Because all the emotions that would have passed through you from their act won't pass through you because you've... you've they're all, they're all clear, they're all gone, they're all passed through, you've, you've chosen to experience them all, any that might be left, and they're all there, and so you automatically... So you can actually look, like with Cornelius, when I was getting nailed to the stake, just look at him and feel the feelings of forgiveness while he was doing the act. Right? So while he was hamming the nail into my wrists, I was looking at him with a feeling of forgiveness. Right? And he reacted to that. Just immediately put down the mallet and walked off. Now somebody else picked it up and... <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and uh, my act of forgiveness toward the other person didn't have the same effect. But, but can you see how it can affect people greatly just by that process of forgiveness? Kim?
Um, just have a question. Do, can can you truly have compassion, true, deep, deep compassion for a person, and through that, you know, a vulnerability and a, and a forgiveness for that person, go through the process of forgiving, but still have residual anger? No. To clean out. No. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> no. It's a the 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 all of the. All of the emotions of love are pure in all of their expression. And you will never, once you've fully experienced forgiveness, you will always feel a sense of compassion and you will never feel any anger or rage or even slight annoyance, to be frank. So, so once all of those emotions pass through us and, and are released from us, we don't ever experience those things. And when you become at one with God, obviously God doesn't ever feel anger towards anything. So at that point, you also will never feel anger towards anyone or anything no matter what they do so so and all of you are totally capable of getting into that state with the reception of divine love right because it, these are divine qualities now we're starting to talk about not just the qualities of natural love so the natural love qualities are very much uh, you could say toned down versions of the real thing and the divine love qualities are the real things that you will eventually develop as you receive more and more and more divine love. Um, judgment. Um, that's something I'm really good at. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us are. <laughs> but I kind of feel I'm really, really good because it keeps me stuck. It keeps you stuck? Yeah. Yeah, certainly. So how do I get off it? There, there's a, always an emotional reason why we judge others. And usually it's something, it, it's a combination of different things, but sometimes it's something that we see in ourselves that we don't like reflected in them, and so we feel that we need to judge them. And that's a very common thing, uh, that we're trying to deny this part of ourselves that we're, we're actually seeing reflected to us, and, and so we immediately judge them. Another reason that we judge is because we view ourselves as greater than the other person, really. And we need to look at ourselves as to what's going on inside of me that would cause me to view myself as better than them. Another thing is that we're often harboring deep hurt about childhood experiences that that particular person is actually doing or carrying out right at this moment. And because they're carrying out or doing it, it triggers an emotion in myself, a reflection of what happened in my childhood, and I immediately judge the person as being like my dad or like my mother or like that brother that I had that was a mongrel. And like, do you know what I mean? And, and so you, you start projecting all of those emotions at the person who's doing the same thing. You can even get down to even looking the same way. So some people have come up to me and said, I just don't like the way you look. You look like this person, and I hated that person. You know what I mean? Like, so, so sometimes we even have those kind of interactions. That something, you know, how many of you noticed how somebody dresses and, not, and really had a big emotional reaction to how somebody dresses? Like negative emotional reaction. It's because of all of our judgments that are in us are all due to the suppression of emotions that we don't want to access within ourselves. So the key for us is to understand every time I'm judging, I am actually projecting an emotion of that I have the right to determine whether they have the right to live or die, basically. And not even God actually does that. So, you know, we're setting ourselves up into a, a very dangerous position. So the key is to allow ourselves to retune back into the emotion that causes us to judge. So there's always an emotion that causes us to judge. So feel, so as soon as you start finding yourself talking about something, ah, oh, da, and away you go, just stop yourself with that, what emotion inside of me is it that they are triggering, that I don't want to feel? Because that's the cause of my judgment. Does that make sense? Just over here. Um, yeah, through a um, like a soul condition that's in error, I've come into conflict with various people in my life. Yep. Where I think uh, I need to forgive them. Yep. But I've, in a way, I've created that situation. I need to deal with that causal emotion first before going to the forgiveness. Or definitely. Yeah. Definitely, it's the causal emotion that causes you to not be able to forgive. So actually allow the, allow the thing you can't forgive to trigger you, feel the causal emotion, really you let yourself feel it. When, you've actually, when it's passed through you completely, you will feel entirely different towards that person. 
So you won't feel any resentment, any harm, or any of those kind of things. In the spirit world, it is a little easier sometimes to forgive. Because what happens is you see a much bigger picture. Um, here on earth, it's very, very hard for you to see the other person's life. It's very hard for you to see the childhood, how they grew up. It's very hard for you to see their current circumstances. It's very hard to see, you know, the emotions within them of how hurt they feel and how painful their life really is to them. And so, um, it, so we often don't forgive the other person. In the spirit world, because you can actually read what's going on in each person's soul quite easily and you can feel the emotions coming from them and you can read the record of their life and you can see all of those kind of things, because you can see all of that, you have a lot more compassion for them. And also because of your distance, you now realise that, hey, wow, you know that $5,000 they stole from me? Up here it didn't really matter very much, you know? Like, <laughs> so there's a lot of distance of the tyranny, we call it of distance here, but out there there's a blessing in distance and that is that we can see things quite easily that we wouldn't have been able to normally see and so it's easier to forgive. So part of this process is actually seeing the truth of their life as well as a part of this process of allowing the forgiveness to take place. Yeah. And in that situation, um, like say I've come into conflict, come into conflict with a few people in a similar way, you know, the same thing is caused. Does, does forgiving one, does that sort of allow me to then easily flow to the others or whatever? Yeah, you know? because if you deal with a law, the, the actual causal emotion that is the reason why you couldn't forgive the first one, there's a high likelihood that your soul condition will change and therefore your law of attraction change and all of them will feel a feeling of forgiveness from you. Very much so. Yeah. <coughs> I just wanted to point out that understanding is different from forgiving though. You can understand and a lot of us do that, oh I understand why they did that and so I forgive them but actually unless we've experienced the emotion causally we, we haven't reached a space of forgiveness yeah. and I know a lot of people who've forgiven without actually having forgiven. Yeah. No, a very valid point Mary brings up. Do you understand that point? Yeah, it's really important to understand unless you experience the causal emotion, you have not forgiven, even when you convince yourself you have. All right, so bear that in mind. And maybe if we go Monica for, uh, and go, go first. Can hurt be a causal emotion? And hurt is usually not a causal emotion, but the feeling of hurt will lead you into causal emotions. Um, so, for example, if somebody does something to me as an adult, I might feel hurt. But underneath that, there's a childhood causal emotion that's unreleased. What if the emotions from childhood, the, the feeling of hurt, is from Then childhood? it may be a causal emotion, yeah. And there's lots of that <coughs> most, for most people. Yep. I'm just wondering, do you... Can you forgive on an, an emotion by emotion basis, if that makes sense? So, for example, I have a lot of anger uh, with my mum. Can I, if I work on, if I'm experiencing an emotion, one particular one, say for a rejection, and I get to the causal of that, and I can find a forgiveness because there's a, a very deep understanding, but a, a release of that. Mm -hmm. Does that mean I I forgive her completely, or do I need to go through that with every emotion that I need to release based on? No, you will need to go through that with every emotion. Okay. Um, okay. The, the truth is, though, that a lot of the emotions combine. So what, what we can often finish up doing is forgive the person through this process that we work through a feeling causal emotion towards the person. So a lot of the reasons why we can't forgive is because we're projecting anger, rage, and other emotions at the person. We're not fully owning the emotion ourselves. And so once we get into that state, we also learn a lot of things about forgiveness. And one of those things is that everything that I feel is, is my own feelings. Not, it's not your fault that I feel this. Uh, even if you kill me, it's not my fault. It's your, not your fault that I feel what I feel from what you did. So, so the key thing is we come to that understanding at the soul level. Now when we come to that understanding at the soul level, we will automatically be able to be forgiving in every situation. But coming to that understanding at the soul level is a big process emotionally, um, of which you know many of us will work through over time. And the, to do it over time, we release one emotion, release another emotion, release another emotion, and we start getting to this place where now we're actually in this space where anything that the person, any person does to me, <coughs> I'm automatically forgiving. But obviously, 
it takes a lot of emotional processing to get to that place. And, and also, does forgi uh, forgiveness of self come into that then? Very much so. And, and would we do that kind of after or before? Because I almost feel as if that's blocking me from, for, you know, I feel so ashamed that I have certain feelings that it's almost getting in the way of forgiving. Um. Almost all of our inability to forgive another person comes from our inability to forgive ourselves. And that's why we need to have a long talk about forgiveness at some point, which we will do. And there's some very good stuff, uh, if you wanted some reading to do about forgiveness, there's some very good stuff in the way of the heart material about forgiveness. Um, I don't forget what, I forget what lessons it is, uh, but um, it's, a, it's a channeling that I did through a man, uh, he wouldn't recognise this at the moment, but it's a channeling I did through a man called J.M., John Mark Hammer, and uh, there's, way, there's three books, Way of the Heart, The Way of... Oh, I can't remember what he called them now, but... Um, and the Way of the Heart, The Way of Transformation, and The Way of... Knowing. Knowing or something. But the whole thing is called The Way of Mastery. And um, they're quite expensive, unfortunately, and I'm meeting the guys who actually do it in the next week to talk about... One of the things I want to talk about with them is making you a bit less expensive for people to read because it's really, really important material, I feel. Although, it does contain a lot of New Age concepts that got mixed in amongst the mediumship. But there's some lovely sessions in there, sections in there about forgiveness that are really worth reading. We will be having a talk about forgiveness. Uh, not just God's forgiveness of yourself, but also forgiveness of your own self and the forgiveness of others. Karen? Up the back, it is. Um, if I feel a bunch of emotions towards God, um, is that and and try and you know like rejection and all the rest of it, and they are released, does that mean I don't have to do it with all the people in my life, or not? Um, the truth is that most of your emotions towards God are created by your emotions that you have towards other people. So what, if you deal causally with most of the emotions you have towards God, then certainly you will also be dealing causally with the emotions you have towards the other people. But there may be emotions that you don't have towards God that you still harbour towards other people. And so you will need to work your way through those separately. But certainly you can work through a lot of emotions by actually just concentrating on the feelings you have towards God. Like, God doesn't love me, God doesn't care for me, God doesn't want me, God doesn't look after me, God doesn't protect me, God doesn't, you know, there's all these different emotions we may have towards God, which all actually come from our belief systems of what's happened in our childhood generally and in our growing life that uh, occurred through interactions with other people. Is it true that through understanding comes forgiveness? Um, no, I think Mary just really pointed that out is that is that forgiveness is not just about understanding the truth is when you forgive you will understand I feel forgiveness comes before understanding um, when you fully forgive it's actually you're going through these emotional processes which cause you to no longer have emotions within you and these emotions it's these emotions within you that cause you to not forgive when you clear those emotions now you will have understanding and that's the time when you're fully forgiven. So forgiveness really comes before understanding, I feel, in a lot of ways. I was going to say exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we should be a bit in tune this day, <laughs> soulmate. What's going on? <laughs> Something's wrong. <laughs> I was also going to offer to uh, email everyone the section on forgiveness from Way of the Heart if they would like. Yeah. yeah. Do you like that? We'll, oh, no worries. We'll send that out. Better ask Raj whether it's possible, though. It's not, it's not copyrighted material, is it? I don't think so. I'll ask I was Raj. just going to type out the couple of pages and send it out yeah, to the yeah, email list. Yeah, we'll, so do that. we'll reference it. Yeah. 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 AJ, it seems like there's a lot of forgiveness that we need to focus on. Where does one start? Is there, do you look at what is present at the time? Like, I yeah. think your law of attraction. Well, in my law of attraction, I have a son that at one stage I thought came from a different galaxy. Yeah. <laughs> and after doing a lot of emotional work on this, 
I realise that he's a reflection of me. Yeah. <laughs> so that means you came from a different galaxy. <laughs> but after listening to your great work for five months now, I realise that I'm from here, yeah. and that I need to. <laughs> and he he's being diagnosed by the the physical world. H A D H D. Yep. And I'm just wondering, on my soul condition, um, what is it that I've got? I'm sort of a trying to grab onto a, a hook. You know what I mean? Because there's a lot of forgiveness, but I don't know which one is more apparent that I've got to be clear on. Everything that your son does is a reflection of what you deny. So allow yourself to be triggered by him and then just go into the emotion. What is it that I am actually feeling from what he just did? Um, so, you know, you might be feeling controlled or you might be feeling manipulated or, you know, so allow yourself to start connecting with a lot of these emotions. A lot of parents feel uh, particularly emotions of control, being controlled and being manipulated, and a child can easily tell when they can control or manipulate their parents, right? And many of you get quite controlled and manipulated by your children. And the reason why is because you still have an emotion in you that allows the manipulation. The key isn't to stop the manipulation. The key is to feel that emotion, release it, and ironically, when you do that, the manipulation from them will automatically cease, generally. Now, it depends on how old they are as to whether it will automatically cease or whether you might need to have some talks with them about it ceasing after you've dealt with the emotion. Because the older they become, the more ingrained the behaviour is and the more the injury exists within them. But when they're quite young, you know, like under sort of seven or eight, nine, whatever, you'll find that those children will a lot of times automatically change in their behaviour towards you. And in fact, many of them will no longer be ADHD or whatever other term we put on them. Because a lot of times all they're doing is reflecting to us our unhealed emotional injuries of l lack of self-worth, which they can easily control and manipulate. Yeah. And they use it through tantrums and, and all these other ways in order to control us. AJ, one of the things I found was that we can't find so easily, or I found very difficult in myself, was shame. Shame yeah. of that I had these feelings toward my children that I was projecting on them. Yep. And I'm just saying this because I know it was one thing that I found as a parent. Very difficult to feel, yeah. Shame is a very difficult emotion, by the way, and a very powerful emotion if you allow it to be felt. Shame is the main reason why you kick into defence. Right? So shame is a major cause of anger and rage. If you allow yourself to feel your shame, many of so if, if some of you are finding that you're having trouble with anger and rage, a lot of times you'll find that it's related to the fact you don't want to feel your shame. So it's a very, very important point. All right, let's move on because there's quite a bit more to do and I don't think I'll cover it, but anyway, we'll see how we go. The next law is the law of mercy that I want to talk about. Now, the law of forgiveness and the law of mercy is very, very... A lot of people think they're the same thing, really. But they are quite different to each other. Forgiveness will become automatic in you, particularly once you become at one with God. You'll get to a point where you will automatically <coughs> forgive any single action that is done against you. Right? That's what will happen with the forgiveness issue. But you will not always demonstrate mercy to the person who has harmed you, even when you are at one with God. And the reason why is because God doesn't automatically demonstrate mercy to people. That's a pretty big comment, huh? The reason why God doesn't do that is because mercy is a different quality. A lot of dictionaries will put mercy and forgiveness as the same meaning. But mercy is this quality of lenience. You see, what happens with God is God automatically forgives every single action that you ever do. Anything thing that you do that's a sin against these laws is automatically forgiven in the, term, in the sense that God harbours nothing against you for those things that you've done. In fact, God 
has this huge compassion for you with everything you've done because he knows that there's going to be lots of pain you're going to need to experience because you did it. Does that make sense? So God has this feeling of huge compassion towards you. But this process of mercy only occurs when you come to recognize what you have done in all its gory detail. Alright? And then God demonstrates lenience, and this is where grace comes in. Right? So grace is this process that God actually allows, does with us, in that when we enter this state of repentance, God, or sorrow, if you like, a deep, felt, heartfelt sorrow about the things we've done, God can now reach into us and take away the reason why we did it. Do you follow me? Right, this is a process of God's love. Now, let's look at our relationships with others and see the interplay of these qualities in our relationships with others. Let's say your partner cheats on you. I'm saying to you that you will need to get to a point of forgiveness if you want to grow spiritually from the event. So that will mean experiencing all of your own emotions about what that's created in you, you know, the feelings of rejection and the feelings of sexual rejection and all these other feelings, right? And get to the point where you actually feel love again for your partner. Right? Now, it might not be the same kind of erotic love, but you'll feel love for them, for your partner. But you may not ever get back together with them. Right? until they demonstrate that they are repentant for their action. Now, the reason why you would wait until they're repentant is because if they're not sorry, have a heart, deep, heartfelt feeling of sorrow for their action, they are probably going to do it again. Right? Because they have not dealt with the causal emotion within themselves that caused them to take the action they took. Right? So this act of forgiveness is something you do for yourself. The act of mercy is what you do for the other person. Do you understand? The act of forgiveness is this feeling where you release all of your own emotions towards the event of the other person. The act of mercy is now you're actually doing something for them. Now, mercy is dependent. If you, if you break the law of mercy, you will feel a lot of pain. For example, let's say the woman who was cheated upon decides to take back her husband. And he has not demonstrated any repentance, right? He, she just decides that she's forgiven him, she's going to take him back. What's a high likelihood of happening? The same event again, right? And what's she going to have to experience again? Forgiveness. forgiveness again, right? She's going to have to work through these feelings that she feels about that again, right? And then he might do it again. Now, a person who's truly forgiven would be okay with that, <laughs> him doing it again and again and again. But at some point, you can see that there's this law of self-love that flicks in, isn't there? At some point, I'm going to have to love myself in this relationship. Do I really want a relationship with a person that keeps wanting relationships with other persons? What kind of relationship do I want? I'm going to have to work through those issues. And if that person is repentant, I can easily display mercy towards them by not asking them to go through the whole process of the law of compensation. You see, what often happens in these kind of situations is the husband cheats on the wife, the wife gets really, really angry. The only way she feels she can make it better is cheat on the husband. Then we're even. <laughs> now we've got justice. Lots of people feel that way, right? You don't know what you've done to me until I do it to you back and then you'll see what you've done to me. But that just harms both people. So my suggestion is, what we need to do is always forgive, but mercy will be displayed when the person actually starts seeing or wants to see what they've done. Can we mic down with me? Do you understand the difference between the two qualities? 
Yeah. I just wanted to point out why that's actually loving. Yep. Um, because the reason why God isn't lenient with us uh, when we're not repentant is because he or she, he, she wants us to experience all of our causal emotions. She wants us to grow spiritually towards her. And actually, if we display mercy at an inappropriate time, we, if we um, look at it in the same way as we look at our relationship with God, mm -hmm. we're actually assisting someone to avoid their causal emotion. Exactly. So it's actually far more loving for us to um, display mercy only when someone's repentant. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, most of us attempted to display mercy before other people are repentant. And we do it for our own emotional reasons most of the time. Because we can't bear the thought of living without them or we can't bear, in the case of the example I've given, we can't bear the thought of living without them or you know, we can't bear you know, acting in truth in the situation. Now when we do that, what actually happens is we enable and actually reinforce their unloving behaviour. Of which we now have partaken and there are law of compensation issues surrounding that for us. So there's something to bear in mind. Thanks Teresa, out the back there. Thanks. How do we get into a state of repentance? Uh, well the state of repentance is a, having a feeling, an emotional, a very very strong uh, when I say very strong, it's overwhelming emotional feeling that of deep sorrow about the things that we've done or about the thing specifically that we've done. And part of that is even understanding the effects of all the people involved in the thing that we've done. And we actually take that, you can take that to God and actually feel that with, with God. But you can also, if you're talking about your relationship with another person, feel that with the other person. So example, if I was the man in that relationship who had cheated on his wife, right? Cheated on, if I'd cheated on Mary, and I, was, and I felt this, this feeling like I, worked, I would have to do a number of things. Firstly, I would have to feel my emotions about what feelings I've created in Mary as a result of that action all of the mistrust she has to deal with now, all of these other feelings that she might have to deal with, I would need to feel about that. I would also need to focus on feeling the causal reason why I actually finished up doing what I did. Does that make sense? And I would need to work through that emotionally. Now I can do all of that with God, I can talk to God about all of those things, right? But I would need to do it all emotionally. And once I've done it emotionally, I will change. I will no longer have the same reasons inside of me as to why I did what I did with Ma towards Mary. Does that make sense? Then you could say, I am really repentant. I've worked through all of those issues. Th now, you can't, you can sort of encourage someone to be repentant, but you can never be repentant for them. Right? And this is why it's a very individual process between you and God as well. Because God can't, he can encourage you to be repentant of, for the things that you've done, but he can't be repentant for you. Only you can do that. And no one else can do it for you either. Only you can do it. So if I was, if I was a man who was cheated on my wife, right, what would happen is inside of myself I would need to go through those feelings. Now, I can go through them with God, but does that fix my relationship with Mary? Not really. Mary would need to see my feelings of repentance, wouldn't she? If there was going to be some mercy from Mary, right? In the sense that, does Mary want to be, I badly might want to be with her still, right? Even though I've done that, I might badly want to be with her, but she may not want to be with me until I've demonstrated to her that I've done all the things and dealt with the reason why I did it so that it would never happen again. So if I don't know the reason, I just need to pray. You need to pray about the reason. So if, if we're feeling that there are things that we've done that we're, we, we've yet to have an emotional feeling or response about that we know were harmful to others, then pray about getting into a state of repentance. It, trust me, it's far faster than having to do the law of compensation with the issue. Right? So it's far better to go into a state of repentance. But it's one of the most hardest and most difficult things to do. 
because no, very few of us want to actually see the things we've done to harm other people. We're happy to see all the things that others have done to harm us, and we're quite happy sometimes to see the things that we do to harm ourselves. But when it comes to seeing the things we've actually done to harm others, that's usually the thing we're most resistive about. So let yourself feel about those. And in fact, that group of emotions, which are all the law of compensation group of emotions, are the most powerful emotions to release in you. And in the end, are the emotions that actually can heal you so much and also make you much closer to God in the process. Yeah. Okay. Just down the front here. So AJ, in a roundabout way, is it almost easier to go via the compensation route if you like? Because or does it make it? Is it just a personal like? If you find it easier to go there first, and it takes you to where you want to go, that's. Um, the law of compensation is operating the moment that you do the sin, whatever the sin is. So remember, I've talked about sin yesterday as missing the mark of love. So the moment you miss the mark of love. The law of compensation is immediately imposed from that moment on. You are already experiencing the law of compensation from that moment on, right? Now, you may experience it for one issue for a hundred years before it's actually forgiven. And when it's forgiven is when you've forgotten it, when you've actually no longer got any emotion left within you about the event that happened. You remember the event in your mind, right? But the soul has no more emotion about the event anymore. So there's a memory of the event in your soul, but no emotion of the memory event in the soul. When you're at that point, you have now right, been forgiven. Until that point, your conscience is going to bother you. You're going to feel feelings of agitation whenever that issue comes up. Whenever you're reminded of it, you'll feel defensive initially, and then afterwards, and eventually you'll get to the point where you realise that, oh, I can think about that event in its complete detail and not feel any feeling in me that, that is harmful to me. Like I don't feel any, I just feel joy and compassion for myself now. When you get to that point, you've, you've forgiven. And you are forgiven as well, ironically. That's how it happens with the law of compensation. With the law of repentance, what happens is that you can actually feel the deep sorrow and feelings of remorse, direct them towards God, and God can actually take away from you the reason why that event happened in you, and immediately after that, or usually a few days after it, because you've been crying for a few days usually before then, you actually get to the point where you realise that the emotion and the cause or reason why you did it has left you, and you also realise that you can think about the event now without any guilt or shame or any of those emotions. Does that make sense? And that, that can happen within a very short period of time. The law of compensation often happens within a very long spread of time about these events. So the way to test it a bit in your own life is to look back on all the things that you're ashamed of in your own life. And when you think about them, how do you feel? Because if you feel something, you have yet to be forgiven. Right? And, or you've yet to be repented. So one of the two, because remember, one of those two processes is what needs to happen before you're completely forgiven. So the repentance process is a law of divine love. The law of compensation process is a law of natural love. We'll talk a lot more about those two processes because they're very, very important for your own spiritual progression at a later time. All right, well, there's a couple more laws to cover and, and uh, it's five o'clock, so I've got to get moving. <laughs> All right, now, the next group are not really single laws. They're like a combination of different principles which are emerging of many of these principles with some additions. So I've called them are a combination of laws, the brief laws of natural love, or a combination of laws that demonstrate how to love oneself and others. So what are some basic laws of love that we want to focus on here? Number one, love cannot be demanded without being unloving. So, whenever you demand another person to love you, whenever you say, no, you're not loving to me, you know, I'm going to reject you now because you're not loving to me, or whatever, any of those things, you're demanding love for them, you are now being unloving yourself. Right at that moment. 
Because love, all of these laws are based on one fact, and that is that love is a gift. So any love that you have for another person is a gift to that other person. In fact, it's the greatest gift you can ever give. Right? Is that your love for another person. And whenever another person loves you, that is the greatest gift that you could ever receive from that person. It's more important than anything else you could receive from that person. And of course, the greatest gift in the universe is God's love for you. Right? Can you see that how they're all related, these gifts that we can give? And in fact, God herself does not demand from you your love. Because God respects the fact that your love is your personal gift. Right? So God doesn't expect you to love her. God desires with all of her heart your love. And you can give it if you choose to, with your free will, give her your love. But you don't have to. And neither do you have to love anyone else. You don't have to love anyone. You'll be quite unhappy if you don't. <laughs> but that's part of the results of breaking the law of love. But you don't have to love anyone. Now, when you think about those particular principles, can you see in your own life where you sometimes demand love from others? And what's going on there? Can you see the actual act of actually expecting someone even to love me is being unloving towards them? Right? And yet how many times do we get upset because I expected you to love me? Or you to love me? Like we often have all of these expectations surrounding love. But love doesn't expect anything from another person. Love is a gift. So therefore it cannot be expected. And in fact, if we believe it can be expected, we have a totally distorted viewpoint of love. Completely distorted. Because love is a gift and it is given with a free heart, like with a free will from your heart. Now when you look at that quality with love and then apply that to all of your relationships, can you see how it could change a lot of relationships automatically? Because a lot of the times what we're doing is we're doing something for another person in order to get a feeling of love back from them, aren't we? And that in itself is an expectation being placed on the person by our, what we're doing, by our gift that we're giving them. And we're certainly not loving them, we're wanting something in return before we will love them. We're going in with this expectation. And you know, expectation creates so much anger. You see, you, you imagine, you go into anything with an expectation, right? What's going, to, what's going to happen when it doesn't happen? You're going to feel like disappointed at least, aren't you? Wow, disappointed. And then if we really take that further, disappointment, annoyed, frustrated, angry, rageful. <laughs> Can you see how it doesn't take long to get from one to the other? Because a lot of times we have these deep expectations. So... Like, my having an expectation that you're going to treat my house well when you come to visit is an actual unloving expectation. Now, of course, if you loved me, you would treat my house well. That is very true. Agreed? But me expecting you to do it is an unloving expectation. So, you know, we walk out, we walk out of the shopping centre, walk up to our car, big, long scratch down the side. What do we feel? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. and particularly if it's a new car like we just got one or whatever and big long scratch down the side we have an expectation that other people treat our property in a loving way we need to release that expectation from ourselves good law of attraction event to release that expectation you want to be able to come out look at the scratch on the side hmm. oh. <laughs> 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 And that's the point, Nina. If we go to that point, we probably won't get the scratch on the car in the first place because of the law of attraction. 
Uh, but the truth is, it doesn't ma mean that, uh, you know, that even when we're at one we've got, we might not get a stretch in our car. <coughs> but what will be our emotional response from it? That's the important thing. What will be our emotional response is that we will actually feel nothing negative from the event whatsoever. Now, if I'm feeling something from the event, then there's a good access for me to get down deeper into the emotion. Right? And this is part of the law of love. The law of love doesn't expect someone else to treat me well. Ironically, when I get into that state, everyone will treat me well. <laughs> because can you see most of the time before then, we're getting triggered with the expectation. What's the difference between desire and expectation? Um, desire is a passionate feeling within yourself to create. An expectation is something you are wanting from someone else to, to get for yourself. Or from the universe to give to yourself. Desire is all about you creating something for yourself. <coughs> expectation is all about other people creating something for you. A very, very different group of emotions. Can you see, everyone see that? So, so when I'm in my desire, I will be in this state where I'm creating. I'll be, wonder, I'll be wondrous about my own creation. I'll look at this creation that I created down this, this scratch down the car and say, I oh, know, a wonderful creator. <laughs> and just connect with the emotion, right? And once I release that causally, then obviously I'll create some different things. The law of desire creates. The look, expectations doesn't create anything. It expects other people to create for you. Now, you look at the world today. How many people in the world expect something from someone else to be created for them? Very, very, very unloving. So allow yourself to feel when you're doing that inside of yourself. When am I doing this process of expecting something from someone else? And really allow yourself to connect to the causal emotion within yourself that actually causes you to believe that you're allowed to expect something from someone else. It was a couple of years ago that I started working through, through these groups of emotions of expectation. And, uh, and I realised early in the time when I met Mary that I had so many expectations about lo lo people loving me. And I had to, and I, and I sat down one day, I actually cried for a couple of days straight about this one, and I just sat down and realised that actually I had to get to the point where I expected nobody at all to ever love me, but that not be a sad place. See, for most of us, if we thought about that, that would be a very sad place, right? And when I first thought about that, it was a very sad place, right? And what we need to do is get to this place where we do not even feel like we need absolutely anyone to love us. Right? Except for God, of course. But even then it wouldn't be an expectation. It would be a gift, gift that God has given us. Not because we expected it, but because he did it before we were even conscious of it. Right? So the truth is that we can actually get to this point of dealing with this emotionally where we get to this point of feeling like we have no, an expectation from nobody to love us. No matter what we do. No matter what we give them. No matter how we help them. No matter what we do for them. No matter whether they're our partner, our son, our daughter, our father, our mother, the sister, our brother. We don't expect anything at all from them. And we certainly don't expect them to love us. Now, when I first contemplated that, I thought, oh my goodness, I've got a lot of work to do. Like, just like, it just overwhelmed me how much work to do. And I talked about it with Mary because we'd met, met soon before, uh, before then, not far before then. And, <laughs> I just said, I just realized this you know, huge amount of work that I had to do about expectation and how unloving it was to have these expectations. And even the expectation that anybody listens to us, the expectation that anybody understands me, the expectation that, you know, that people want to be with me, the expectation that somebody buys me a Christmas parent, pet present or a birthday present, all of those expectations are all unloving. 
Right? Now, when you get to that place, it's really interesting because you get to this place where you don't expect anybody to do anything, and absolutely everything that you get is a gift. <laughs> when you get to that place emotionally, it's amazing. Right? And I'm not there yet, and, but I have a memory of, it, of being there, and it's an amazing place. So allow yourself to deal with all of your expectations. Because all of your expectations and all of your demands and all of those things are all unloving. You see, in a relationship even, often what we're asking ourselves is, you know, what can they do for me? What are they doing for me? What are they doing for me? You know, you're not treating me lovingly. You don't care about me. You haven't done this for me. You haven't done that for me. We very rarely um, ask ourselves, well, why do I expect them to do that for me? Do we? It's like, and most of us justify it and we say, but isn't love like that? If they love me, they'd do it for me. Well, that, that's true. If they loved you, they might do it for you. But the fact that you expect it, you're actually now being unloving. <laughs> and there's an emotion you need to work your way through with that. Does everyone follow me with that? Yeah. yeah. So the laws of love, and I want to go into the laws of love uh, over a lot over the coming months because they're just so, so interesting. Uh, I find them really interesting with all of interpersonal relationships. When you're truly practicing love, there is no pain in any relationship. So any time you feel pain in any relationship, there's an issue of love inside of yourself that is yet to be resolved. And that's one of the major things that I'm learning in this process or relearning in this process is this, this uh, coming from a condition of sin, I believed a lot of things that I never believed in the first century, but now I do because of the condition of sin. And coming through that process, I'm starting to realise in the end, the thing that I realised and remembered right at the beginning in the last process, and that is that in the end, almost everything that I can learn is a lesson of love for myself like a lesson of love that I need to learn inside of myself. Any hurt that I'm experiencing is something inside of me that isn't right. Any pain that I'm experiencing, any suffering I'm experiencing, any physical ailment I'm experiencing is something inside of me that isn't harmonious with love. And I need to allow myself to feel it. And once I feel it and release it, I will become harmonious with love. And that pain, whatever that pain is, emotional, physical, whatever the pain is, it will leave me. And understanding that has a huge effect on us in terms of our life. Now, there's one other law, and I haven't talked about the law of love uh, very much, because uh, and something my suggestion is to read a bit more about those things that I've covered there, because I do want to cover the law of truth as well. I want to cover the law of truth as well. The law of truth, and particularly the law of divine truth, is, is basically, as I've stated here, we always live in harmony with divine truth as we know it emotionally. Now, the beauty of this is that when you come to understand the power of the truth, and I actually feel that the laws of truth are some of the most, are, are perhaps even the most powerful law of love in the universe, in that truth leads you to love. It's the you free because it's the truth that actually leads you to perfected love. Without the truth you can't ever get there. So the truth is such an essential part of what you will become. In fact you'll get to a point in your own progression that the truth is so essential to you you cannot live without it or out of it. Ever. So you imagine that in your relationships. What that means in your relationship, that every single emotion passing through you is going to be reflected in all of your relationships. So let's say you're staying with your mum and dad right now. And you have a feeling of condescension from your dad. You say, Dad, I have a feeling that you're treating me condescendingly now. And this makes me feel da 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 da, -da and off you go and have a cry <laughs> right in front of him. Right? <laughs> Now that would be in a space of truth with your father. Does that make sense? Now that has a huge power, a, f a power you cannot imagine, because 
he will be, his heart will just be drawn into this because every single person's heart at some level has this little connector, sometimes it's little, little tiny, but sometimes it's quite big, connection to truth. You look at every child. Most children have this connection with truth and it gets brow beaten out of us by a very young age because they're so afraid of us, right, as adults. And so they learn that uh, lie here and there prevents pain. But if you took away the pain from every truth experience that they had, do you think they'd want truth or lies? What do you want? What, when are the times when you've been hurt the most? Isn't it when someone's lied to you? Or when you've worked out you've been lied to? A lot of times that's the most painful experiences that you've ever had. Right? And this is the case, the truth is the thing that sets you free, but the lies actually bind you up in this terrible, stagnated place. Lies are so soul-destroying. The truth, you know, when it, hits you, when it hits you, when you hear truth, how do you feel inside of you? Like, it just feels so buoyant and encouraged and uplifted, don't you? That's how you feel, isn't it? When you feel this truth resonating in you. So if you are actually truthful in all of your interactions with the people around you, what's that going to do for that? It's going, isn't it going to uplift them as well? It's going to connect to their soul? Now, if you're withholding divine truth from a person because of an emotional reason within yourself, can you see that there must be a law you're breaking there? Because you're actually preventing the other person from experiencing bliss by your own decision. And your decision might be, oh, they'd never hear that. You know, they'd never listen to that. Or the decision might be, you know, I don't think they're ready. Who, who gave you the right to decide whether they're ready? The truth is the truth. The truth is this thing of beauty. The truth is something that everyone in the world needs to know, whether they know it or not. Right? Take every opportunity you can to speak the truth to others. You are demonstrating love to them. Take every opportunity to feel the truth of your own emotions. You are de demonstrating love of yourself and love to the other persons in all of your relationships when you do that. When you avoid the truth emotionally inside of yourself, you are avoiding rea relating to every single person around you emotionally on a truthful level. So allow yourself to see the power of the truth in your life. It's such an important lesson on the divine love path to understand and feel the truth right down deep inside of you. It's such an important lesson that the majority of, has, of us have such resistance to because we're in these levels of fear, you know, this fear that just dominates us and prevents us from actually acting in truth. Well, like I'm still afraid about all sorts of things myself, you know, and I'm working through these fears because in the end they just prevent me from living in truth, right? So just myself and Mary this week, we're working through the issue of my potential death, right? In the first century, I died from speaking the truth, you know. My feelings are that, um, that it's probably not going to happen this time, but I don't know. And I've had lots and lots of emotions to deal with about that through my life. But let yourself feel it. If you feel that something bad is going to happen from speaking the truth, feel the emotion, work through the emotion, because the truth itself has this huge power to create beautiful things around you. And without it, the earth is not going to change. Nothing on earth is going to change without the truth. Nothing at all. So what I'm hoping that you see from these laws, including the laws of love and the law of truth right, is that there are just so many powerful lessons to be learnt in there with your reaction and interaction with other people. <coughs> Allow yourself, instead of just coming to these groups and actually you know, being encouraged, Allow yourself to reflect upon your own life and how you can put into practice these laws and allow yourself to feel the benefits of them. Nothing that is said in any of these sessions will benefit you unless you're actually starting to feel it and actually put it into practice in your own life. You're better off not coming if you don't want to put it into practice. Because in the end, you know what's going to happen? And this happens all the time with everyone. The more truth you hear, the more discrepancy there's going to be between the truth you hear and what you're practicing. And the more that happens, the more hurt you're going to feel. 
So you're better off stopping hearing the truth right now if you're never going to practice it. Does that make sense? You are far better off, like if you hear the truth, put what you've learnt in practice over the coming weeks. You're far, far better off doing that for your own soul and for your own sanity. I've found lots and lots of people got to a point where they heard more truth, heard more truth, heard more truth. This is their soul condition here. Hear more truth, hear more truth, hear more truth. And what's happening now is there's huge amounts of pain about every single truth they hear. Don't do that. Don't put off releasing the emotion and bringing the emotion up with you. Because the more you listen to truth without actually doing anything about it, the more harm you are going to feel inside of yourself. Because there's a law governing that too, believe it or not. And we can talk about that law at another time. Right? But there is a law actually governing the fact that you're not acting upon the truth you've learned. And there will be pain in your soul if you don't do that. My suggestion too is often we're t focused on preventing pain. And you know, when we do that, we're not focused on the pleasure that we can receive from actually living in harmony with what we learn. You know, there's so much pleasure you can get from that. You know, you, there's so much joy and power that you can get from that that you, you won't worry about fear of your pain. Pain, ugh, you know, pain is nothing, you know. Let's get through that and let's focus on, on the feelings of truth and love that we have that we are totally capable of demonstrating. Because when we do that, we're getting ourselves closer and closer to God, not just intellectually. So at the moment, many still understanding things from an intellectual point of view feel very attracted. Many of you feel very attracted to the truths. But let now the truths influence your life. Right? <coughs> Develop your relationship with God and others using these truths and see what happens. You know, be like a scientist with this stuff. Experiment with it and see whether it works. That's the best thing to do. Allow yourself to do that. Well, uh, we'd like to uh, thank you uh, for hearing us this weekend again, and uh, we've enjoyed your company again. Myself and Mary are working through some quite difficult emotions at the time, so we are uh, both have had a fairly heavy weekend ourselves, and uh, so we're sorry if we haven't been as present as we normally are with you. But uh, we are now going to be travelling um, down the coast. Uh, we're, next weekend we'll be having a meeting down at Gosford, um, and there'll be some people, I think, from Sydney there as well, and some people across, you guys are coming across, eh? Somewhere closer to you. And, um, and then we'll be travelling up uh, to Armadale, and we're having a meeting at Armadale. And in between that, uh, we're meeting up with some friends in the Gold Coast who uh, do the Way of the Heart material. And so it's going to be a very interesting trip for us, meeting up with new people and seeing what comes out of these new, new uh, relationships. And... Um, our next time that we'll meet the majority of you is when we're in Brisbane in the 1st and 2nd of August. So we look forward to meeting you guys then. Thanks for your time. <laughs>